Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. If I could ask you to take your seats, we'll get started. Executive Director Moan, distinguished panelists, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, the fifth Law Day public lecture. These lectures are intended to mark the adoption of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, now 37 years ago, on April the 17th, 1982. My name is Robert Hawkins, and I'm a professor of law in the Johnson Shoyama School of Public Policy. Each year, Johnson Shoyama partners with the Canadian Bar Association, Saskatchewan branch, to host these lectures. I want to thank the CBA, and in particular, to thank Mr. Neil Robertson, QC, whose wise guidance has made this event possible. I also want to thank Johnson Shoyama's Karen Jaster Lafarge, who has, been so help, who has been so helpful in organizing today's talk. We hope that through these Law Day lectures, we're able to highlight a contemporary issue at the conjuncture of Canadian law and public policy. Past lectures have dealt with the topics of sexual harassment in the workplace, access to justice, the place of diverse communities in the Canadian judicial system, and the criminal law standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. This year, our panel will explore medical assistance in dying, legal and medical realities. The topic is one of deep significance to Canadians, a topic that was brought to the fore largely through Section 7 litigation under the Charter, first in the Supreme Court of Canada Rodriguez decision, and subsequently when that case was overturned in 2016 in the Carter decision. Our distinguished guests will examine the impact of these developments on patients, their caregivers, their families, and on the legal community. Dr. Brian Salty, to Amy's right, is, an, is the Associate Registrar of and Legal Counsel to the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Saskatchewan. Educated at the University of Saskatchewan, he was appointed Queen's Counsel in 2009 and received the Distinguished Service Award from the Canadian Bar Association in 2016. He has written extensively on the regulation of the health profession and served on several expert panels that have developed policy on medical assistance in dying. He is currently a member of the Oversight Committee that reviews deaths by medical assistance in Saskatchewan. To Dr. Salty's right is Dr. Rob Weiler, who received his medical degree and a master's in public administration public health from the University of Saskatchewan, as well as a fellowship from the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in anesthesiology. For over 20 years, he served at St. Paul's Hospital's intensive care unit. He is currently the medical advisor for the Saskatchewan Medical Assistance in Dying program and is a strong advocate for linking acute care needs and community health services. Our panel moderator, Professor Amy Zerthetsny, is a valued teacher and administrator in our Johnson Shoyama School. She has been instrumental in making the Johnson Shoyama Master's in Health Administration degree the leading degree program of its kind in this country. Amy researches extensively in the areas of health law and policy and in emergence, emerging and experimental medical intervention. You may be able to tell from my voice today that I may be a candidate for medical intervention myself, <laughs> although I'm not sure I want these guys on the case. We all are very much looking forward to the upcoming discussion. I would like to invite Professor Zarchechny to take the chair. Thank Amy. you very much. Thank, Thank you for those comments, Bob, and introductions. And welcome, everyone. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you joining us here in the room today and all of you joining remotely via Zoom. We are uh, located here on Treaty 4 territory, and we have colleagues joining us from Treaty 6 
and we welcome all of you to this important discussion as well. For those who are uh, linking in remotely, we would ask if you could please keep your microphones muted for the duration of the presentations, that would be very helpful. You will have an opportunity to participate and ask questions at the end of the presentations, uh, either perhaps by your microphones or maybe simplest if you could please use the chat function uh, on Zoom and then I will moderate from uh, the podium and try to answer your questions uh, from there. You can always jump in with your mics if I miss any of them. As Professor Hawkins introduced, this is a very, I think, important uh, and complex topic, also often a very controversial one. In addition to the weighty legal issues that have come before the Supreme Court of Canada, both in Carter and earlier in Rodriguez, this is an issue that raises multifaceted public policy questions as well. It also often engages people's deeply held beliefs and I think highlights the many challenges that decision makers face when trying to balance diverse and sometimes competing priorities, ranging from respecting individual autonomy to protecting vulnerable individuals to considering health system implications, among many others, not to mention potentially conflicting charter values. Notwithstanding the Supreme Court's guidance in Carter and the framework provided in the legislation that has subsequently been passed at the federal level, the matter of medical assistance in dying in Canada is far from settled. And indeed, there are some very important issues and considerations left outstanding. So we're very fortunate to have these two um, highly experienced <coughs> individuals with us today to share their perspectives and insights based on their experiences on working in this topic. So with that, I will invite uh, Mr. Salte to please take the floor. The format for this afternoon will be we'll have two presentations to start. I would ask that you please save your questions until the end. And we will save quite a bit of time at the end of the afternoon for a facilitated discussion and question and answer session. So thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and thank you, Professor Hawkins. I don't remember getting my PhD, but maybe you can do something about that. You introduced me as Dr. Salty. Uh, I noticed a few faces that I recognize in the audience, and uh, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I do agree that this is an important topic, and I find it particularly relevant that this uh, came from a charter decision, Section 7 charter decision, and we're here speaking about the charter as part of the Law Day celebration. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. And uh, as Dr. Weiler and I have spoken about this, feel free to ask us any questions that you would like. Uh, we don't pretend that we have all of the answers, and some of these things, as uh, Professor Zarazechny was saying, are sometimes challenging their different perspectives. So Rob and I had a discussion where we were disagreeing just before we started all of this. So I suspect we'll have a bit of a lively discussion. So I'm going to be talking about a few things here. Uh, one will be the criminal code provisions, which uh, were the subject of the Carter decision. Then the Carter decision itself, which concluded that the criminal code provisions were, un were uh, unconstitutional. Uh, some things about some surveys and some current outstanding issues because by no means all of the issues have been uh, settled as they relate to medical assistance in dying. There's still a number of things which are, are unresolved. And then finally, some statistics and opinions uh, surveys that uh, I think cast light on what the attitudes of Canadians are and, uh, and where we may potentially be going in some of these topics. So this is terminology that we will use. Uh, at the time of the Carter decision, uh, the common terminology was physician-assisted dying. Well, there are a couple of reasons why that didn't survive, one of which is nurse practitioners can now participate in this as well. So it's practitioner, nurse practitioners and physicians. So the current term that's used in the legislation is medical assistance in dying. Uh, that's the commonly used term in, in Canada. If you look at international terms, it's, there's a variety of different terms that are sometimes used, sometimes referring to euthanasia and, and other terms. But this is the term that has come to be accepted in Canada, medical assistance in dying. Um, this is the criminal code and the prohibition. So I'm not a doctor. Uh, I cannot help somebody to commit suicide. I cannot uh, counsel them or suggest to them that they should, they should commit suicide. If somebody says, um, I'm thinking about ending my life and I say, well, I just happen to have a gun here, um, I've committed an offense by doing that. Uh, and that is what the legislation was uh, and still is, uh, subject to that exception that uh, came about as a result of the Carter decision. You can't counsel somebody to commit suicide and you can't help somebody to commit suicide. If you want to get into your time machine and go back about 30 years, it was even a, an offense to try to commit suicide, but the government decided that didn't make a whole lot of sense to punish people who had tried to kill themselves. 
Um, and then the other part of it is no person is entitled to consent to death or serious bodily harm. Uh, so that it isn't a defense to say, I was only helping this person to do what, I, what they wanted to do anyway. So helping somebody is a, a criminal offense unless you fall within the exception that came about with Bill C-14, which is what I'll be talking about. And this is, many of you will be familiar with Section 7 of the Charter. Um, uh, and most of you will probably be familiar with the fact that the Charter overrides other legislation if there's a conflict that's found between the Charter and the other legislation. So I will read it. I won't read most of my slides, but I will read this one. Everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security of the person and the right not to be deprived thereof except in accordance with principles of fundamental justice. The government can't take away these fundamental rights. Um, and that's what the Carter decision was all about. Uh, can the government take away uh, your right as a patient to ask a physician to end your life? Can the government take away the right of a physician to decide to assist somebody who meets certain criteria? Uh, the first Carter decision was February of 2015. Um, and what it said was that the criminal code provisions which prohibit a patient from assisting to die unconstitutional if the patient meets certain criteria. This does not mean that everybody gets to ask for medical assistance in dying. This doesn't mean that I could go to uh, Dr. Weiler and say, I, I'm tired of life, please let me help my, uh, please help me end my life. Because if he was to do that in those circumstances, that's still a criminal offense. Um, so there, there was a, a, a limitation on when it applied. Um, and as is usual in constitutional legislation, the, uh, the uh, court said, you've got one year to, uh, to get your act together, legislature. And uh, after one year, uh, this prohibition will come into effect. And some of you may be aware that, uh, uh, for example, with respect to the abortion decision, uh, the, it was declared unconstitutional and the federal government never got around to, uh, to passing abortion legislation. So one of the options that would have been available to the government would have been to simply not pass any legislation at all, and then the criminal code prohibitions would have been subject to uh, the uh, limitations in, in the Carter decision. But that's not what the government did. Uh, uh, sorry, well, let's first talk about the declaration. So the, the, the Supreme Court of Canada said that there are, there are restrictions on this. The person has to clearly consent to the termination of their life. And the person has to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition that causes enduring suffering that is intolerable to the individual. So it has to be intolerable suffering, it has to be grievous and irremediable medical condition. Those are the conditions that uh, must exist in order for the Carter decision to apply. So again, grievous medical condition, not remediable using treatments a patient is willing to accept. And this is an important restriction on that. I'm not, if I would otherwise qualify, that doesn't mean I have to exhaust every possible medical treatment that might exist out there. I can say, I'm prepared to accept these medical treatments, but not those. And that doesn't exclude me, simply because maybe there might be some theoretical treatment out there that might help me. I, I get to decide whether I am going to accept other treatments or not. Um, and the patient's suffering must be intolerable to the patient. Most of the rest of these things are relatively objective. This is really subjective. And so what you have is, uh, is the patient suffering intolerable? Well, some people will have incredible pain and people will have uh, really, really serious medical conditions. And they'll say, no, I still want to live. For them, it's not intolerable. Other people will have significantly less objective symptomatology, uh, but nonetheless, they, to them, those conditions are intolerable. And the last slide, I think gives some insight into how different people view uh, restrictions on their ability to enjoy a full and regular life. So I think it's important to understand what the court was saying. And the focus was on uh, saying to people, the government can't get in the way. The government can't prevent uh, two consenting people, the physician and the patient, uh, from acting together to allow the patient to have their suffering uh, ended. So it was a focus on here are patients who are suffering horribly. Some of the examples were uh, patients were choosing to commit suicide uh, themselves, put a gun in their mouth or do something else, when there was a much more humane way of dealing with it. And so it, uh, the Carter decision refers to this horrible choice 
that some patients were put to because their, their suffering was intolerable, but there was no legal way for them to, to uh, end their life. And very often these patients, of course, are in extremists. Their uh, ability, their mobility is very limited, et cetera. And so that was the, the reasoning was government can't get in the way uh, of uh, people making these choices uh, based upon these conditions. Um, and then we had six months where if, you, if a patient wanted to uh, access a medical assistance in dying, uh, they had to go to court and get a court order uh, because there was an election that intervened, the legislation didn't come into effect, et cetera. But then, uh, I'm sorry, the legal effect of Carter, again, just to sort of emphasize this, um, there was no criminal offense if the physician met the criteria. Uh, governments couldn't impose restrictions inconsistent with Carter, but it's important also to understand there's nothing here that said that uh, governments were forced to provide medical assistance in dying. They just didn't prevent medical assistance in dying. So for example, some of the things I've read recently with one of the provinces in Eastern Canada is very much like abortion in Prince Edward Island, you just can't get it. And I understand that's also true of medical assistance for dying in one of the provinces. So there's nothing that says government has to fund this. There isn't anything that says government has to, uh, has to facilitate it. Government just can't get in the way and prevent it from occurring. So then we have Bill C-14. This is the June of, of uh, 2016 legislation. Um, and these are the criteria that you have to meet. Essentially, the government wanted to prevent medical tourism. Uh, unlike Switzerland, where people fly in all the time and in order to have their lives ended, uh, you can't come into Canada from outside Canada and say, I want the help of a doctor. Uh, so that is a prohibition. Uh, the person has to be 18. I'll be talking about that just a little bit. Uh, not available currently, at least to people under the age of 18. The person has to be capable of making decisions about their health. And that's one of the really big focuses on the legislation and the way it's been implemented is how do we make sure that people are actually making a conscious choice and they understand what their choices are. They have to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. Um, there can't have been any pressure uh, to cause that person to say, I would like medical assistance in dying, and they have to give them informed consent. And these are, again, the criteria. Serious and incurable illness, disease or disability, advanced state of irreversible decline in capability, enduring physical or psychological suffering intolerable to the individual. And again, I want to repeat that uh, emphasis. It's intolerable to the individual, which may be different for me and you and everybody else in the room as to what is intolerable. Suffering can't be relieved under conditions they consider acceptable. And then this is the one that we may spend a little bit of time talking about uh, this afternoon. The natural death has become reasonably foreseeable without a prognosis necessarily having been made as to the specific length of time that they have remaining. And that's the one that I think is somewhat controversial, and Rob and I won't necessarily see this exactly the same way. But he's the doctor and I'm not. Um, so then there's some technical things, and all of these technical things are there to try to make sure that, they, that the system has done everything to make uh, certain that the patient really understands what they're getting into, really understands what their options are, have really made a choice, and that choice is not gonna change tomorrow or the day afterwards. So two independent witnesses, there have to be two nurse, uh, two of physicians or nurse practitioners, could be one of each, could be two of either one of those, uh, have to certify that in their opinion, the patient meets the criteria. Uh, there has to be, unless there's a, a shortening of the period in specific circumstances, 10 days. So if I was qualifying for medical assistance in dying and now is April the 3rd, uh, Rob and somebody else could uh, assess me, say, yes, indeed, you meet all the criteria, but they couldn't actually complete it until April the 13th, 10 days later, uh, when I have to again say, yes, I really do want medical assistance on dying. I confirm what I told you on April the 3rd, and at that point, uh, that could be administered. There are some exceptions for imminent death or imminent loss of, of uh, capacity. And then the pharmacists have to be informed what these medications are being used for because there was a concern about the belief systems of pharmacists and uh, if they are dispensing medications to cause somebody's death and they have a, a uh, objection, a moral objection to that, they should, should know that that's what the purpose of the, of the medications is. So uh, again, Bill C-14, the uh, 
physician or nurse practitioner, both of them must be of the uh, uh, opinion that the patient meets the criteria. This is the person who's actually administering this. So the person who's actually responsible for putting the medication in the IV or the person who's actually dispensing the, the medications that the patient will take, uh, they must be uh, satisfied that the made criteria has been met and they have to say, you can withdraw this at any time. So if we're my hypothetical example, it's now April the 13th, I've had my 10 days, uh, and Rob is the one who's providing this, he will have to say to me, you understand that this isn't final, you can withdraw your consent, do you agree to continue with this? And if I say yes, then that can continue. And then provide the opportunity to withdraw. So exemptions from criminal liability, what the legislation says is, the doctors and nurse practitioners who follow the rules are not subject to criminal prosecution. It also says the doctors and nurses who believe they're following the, good, the rules and are acting in good faith, even if somebody else might disagree, are not subject to, to criminal prosecution. Uh, anybody who aids this, because of course, medicine isn't practiced by the way it was uh, 40 years ago with a single doctor, now everything is in teams. So you may be using uh, various ancillary person to insert IVs or, or do other things. Anybody who helps the, the physician or the nurse practitioner is exempt from prosecution. Uh, pharmacists can't be prosecuted for dispensing the medication. Uh, individuals who assist somebody, so if you have a patient who wants to self-administer and they're in their home or someplace else uh, and they're having difficulty swallowing the medications, uh, anybody can help them. It doesn't have to be a medical practitioner. And finally, healthcare workers, social workers, and others who provide information. Because it was a concern, what about the social worker that says, here are these options that are available to you. We can arrange for you to go and see somebody who can assess you for eligibility for MAID. Some of them were concerned that this might potentially give them criminal liability for counseling. And this was an exemption in the, in the legislation as well. So there's two choices. If you look to the legislation across the world, uh, most of the places allow either for self-administration, like Oregon, you have to get the medication, you have to get it yourself, you have to swallow it yourself, the doctor doesn't do that. Uh, or they, uh, it can be administered medically, usually by an IV, uh, but in Canada, under this legislation, it could be either. So uh, again, if I qualify, uh, Rob can prescribe the medications I can swallow, or Rob can take me into a place where I can have an IV administered and, uh, and death can occur as a result of either one of those routes. So a few issues that aren't resolved from the legislation. Um, and uh, I was involved in uh, Council of Canadian Academies that did uh, three reports to the Government of Canada on these first of these three topics. Um, and uh, because when Bill C-14 was passed, the government said, we're not going to decide whether people under the age of 18 or, uh, or people who want to make an advanced directive or people with mental disorder should qualify. We'll get reports, we'll think about it, we'll consider that. So the first mature minors, what about that 16, 17, 14 year old who's allowed to make every other medical decision, but they're not allowed to make medical assistance in dying decisions. So they're allowed to say, I refuse all intervention, I understand I'm gonna die, but that's my choice, they're allowed to do that. But they're not allowed to, to uh, access medical assistance in dying. So should that be an exception to the legislation? That's a question the government will have to address. What about an advanced directive? Because one of the things that happens out there right now that is a very big concern, and Rob can speak to it, I know he's seen this once or twice, uh, somebody qualifies, they meet all of the criteria, you've got the family that are all gathered around, they're waiting to say goodbye to their, to their family member, and they lose consciousness. Now you can't administer medical assistance in dying because there's no ability to have an advanced directive, there's no ability for that person to say, yes, I still want it, despite the fact that one hour ago they clearly did. So that's a, a, an interesting and challenging issue. And what about purely psychiatric or mental conditions? Uh, should people who don't have a physical condition but have uh, all of the other criteria in a psychiatric condition, should they be allowed to access medical assistance in dying? In that six month period that I spoke about uh, where you had to go to a, to a court, there was a decision out of Alberta that said, Yes, this patient with a purely psychiatric condition meets all, the, uh, all of the requirements of the Carter decision and was allowed to access medical assistance in dying. The legislation doesn't allow that, at least based upon my opinion. So that's going to be an interesting challenge, maybe uh, resulting in some court decision. Availability of supportive palliative care have an effect on patient choice? 
because right now palliative care sucks. There isn't very much of it out there. There isn't enough of it out there. I think pretty much everybody will agree. But the experience in the Netherlands, I think it was, actually found that when they gave better palliative care, there was more medical assistance in dying. People felt that they had choices. This is the, the thought process anyway. But there are people who believe if only we had appropriate uh, palliative care, uh, then we would have much less medical assistance in dying. And there are other people who will believe that actually if we had better palliative care, we might have more. What the, what the reality is, who knows? Will there be different regimes with different requirements in the provinces and territories? If there are different criteria or interpreted to be different criteria, are people going to start flying off to Vancouver Island to say, well, I know I can access it there, but I can't access it in uh, Saskatchewan, either because it's more easily available there or because the requirements are being interpreted differently. Again, there's a possibility of tourism, and I spoke about one of the eastern provinces, which, again, from what I've read, it's virtually unavailable. And if you want medical assistance in dying, you have to leave the province. Will a patient's choice of medical assistance dying void their life insurance? I don't think that's been decided yet. My understanding is that the insurance companies have said, no, it won't, but that's not been tested. And so far as, and there was some discussion about legislation, but so far as I know, it's not been tested. I can tell you about a friend of mine who went through a very unpleasant death because he was afraid that his wife would not get life insurance. Um, rather than accessing MAID. And he was very concerned that if he accessed MAID, his life insurer is going to say, that's suicide, that's excluded in the policy, we're not going to pay out. So it is, a, I think, an issue. And what obligations, uh, we can talk about this at some later time, what do obligations, including faith-based institutions, have in relation to medical assistance in dying? Because there are faith-based institutions who say, we will not allow this to occur in our facility or we'll limit what's available in our facility. And there are some interesting human rights issues associated with that, I think. So those are some of the questions. Here are some of the court challenges that are going on right now because uh, we don't know what direction this is gonna go and you'll see that there are four, four court challenges, three distinctly different ones. The uh, LAM out of BC, the uh, Gladue in, out of Quebec are basically the same thing in which they say uh, the legislation which says there has to be a reasonably foreseeable death is not consistent with the Carter decision. There's nothing in Carter that says that it, the death has to be reasonably foreseeable. It talks about suffering and irremediable and all those sorts of things, but not imminent death. And so we'll see what happens out of uh, those two decisions. All of the evidence is, in, is been finished in the Quebec decision, so we're just waiting for the, the decision to come. The evidence is still uh, uh, ongoing with respect to British Columbia. Uh, Christian Medical, or Canadian Medical and Dental Society, sorry, that says Canadian, it should be Christian Medical De and Dental Society. Um, they have challenged the requirement in Ontario that says there must be an effective referral by a physician. So in, in Ontario, uh, if a patient uh, wants to talk to their physician about medical assistance in dying and that person has a conscientious objection, they don't have to assess the patient, they don't have to, uh, have to uh, perform it for the patient, but they do have to give an effective referral. And the lower court said that's perfectly constitutional, that's not a problem, it's not an infringement of the, of the physician's rights in a way that contravenes the charter and can't be saved. Uh, because there are other competing interests that are at least as important. It's now gone off to the Ontario Court of Appeal. We'll see what the Ontario Court of Appeal does with that. And then the final court challenge, and this is the one which is the completely the opposite direction. It's a person that has a very serious medical condition, and his perspective, at least in the court decision is, or court, court argument is, I'm only be give, being given two choices here, horrible suffering or medical assistance in dying and you are depriving me of my constitutional rights by not giving me better care during this period of time because I really don't want to die. And so I'm now being deprived of my rights and this whole legislation is unconstitutional because it doesn't have any built-in protection to ensure that people who don't want to die but have horrible suffering are actually going to be treated appropriately. So it's a very different perspective than the other, uh, other uh, court challenges we have there. So, I'm fairly close to winding up, but these are just some things that are ongoing. We have a, the College of Physicians and Surgeons developed a policy that talks about a number of things. Here's how you make sure the patient is truly consenting. Here's your obligations towards your patient. Here's your object, obligations if you have a conscientious objection to this. Um, here's the protocols that we expect you to follow. 
uh, it's taken a fair bit of time to, to develop this, uh, but it's now something that we have provided as guidance for Saskatchewan physicians. We're concerned about the qualifications uh, of physicians who might provide medical assistance in dying. We don't want another Kevorkian here, for those of you who may recall Kevorkian, the pathologist of years ago, uh, who uh, was assisting patients to die, but probably didn't have the training, didn't have the experience. He was just a true believer that if that's what patients want, that's what they get. Um, and we want to make sure that the people who are involved in this are actually uh, have the training and experience to uh, properly assess patients, make sure that they meet the criteria, are interpreting the legislation appropriately, and have the knowledge of, for example, the medications to make sure that they are going to cause the death of the patient. Because I can tell you that there have been some really unfortunate situations where medications provided to patients didn't cause their death and may just have increased su suffering. So you want to make sure that this, if this is going to be done, it's going to be done right. And finally, um, and this is referenced earlier, there's an oversight body to look at the deaths uh, that are, arise uh, from medical assistance in dying, and we'll be having our first meeting in the fairly near future. So what about the availability, and this is something Rob can speak about more, uh, better than I can, but uh, what about uh, the availability? So availability in Saskatoon is pretty good. But what about in some First Nation community in the far north? What about uh, some other rural communities? There's, uh, the access to this is, is not what at least I would hope. Um, and Rob, again, is in a better position to address that. But it is a concern uh, that uh, some of these services uh, to have somebody who's going through uh, a terminal situation and now they have to tr uh, travel maybe in extreme pain, maybe with significant disability, in order to be able to access medical assistance in dying is, I think, a significant concern. So this is the final few topics. Uh, just some numbers. Um, British Columbia has more medical assistance in dying than the rest of the country for reasons that are unclear. About 1.7% of all deaths in British Columbia are now medical assistance in dying. But in Vancouver Island, it's 3.5%. So it's happening much more frequently. Why? I'm not sure that, that I can respond to that, but it certainly is occurring. The numbers I've heard across Canada are suggested somewhere around 1% of deaths are now medical assistance in dying. So it's happening quite frequently. One of the things that was a big surprise to Alberta was they were expecting to see a few of these cases. And then as soon as medical assistance in dying became legal under the current regime, uh, they, there was a much larger number of requests than they'd ever anticipated. So that uh, came as a surprise to the people involved in this in, in Alberta. One of the things that I found interesting is that based upon any of the surveys that have been done, there's really quite overwhelming support for medical assistance in dying in, among Canadians in some circumstances. As soon as you get further away from the fully competent adult uh, with, with a physical condition about to cause their death, it becomes a little bit less clear. But 85% of Canadians supported the Supreme Court's decision in, in Carter, according to an Ipsos Reid uh, uh, survey. I'm not aware of anything since 2016, because uh, I've looked around and I can't find it, so I don't think it's been surveyed since then. 80% uh, support the advanced care directive that would allow for a request in some circumstances. 74% uh, 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 would allow it for people who are competent uh, at the time of the request, but not competent at the time it's being carried out. Essentially the same question being asked in two different ways. One had 80% positive, the other 74% positive. 52% um, say we shouldn't be giving med uh, medical assistance in dying to people who have a purely psychiatric condition, and about 60% don't want minors to be given access, according to the 2016 poll. Uh, and about a quarter of the Canadian physicians in the most recent poll I know about have said that I would be willing to help at least in some circumstances. Now, it may be very limited, it may be only their own patients, it may be only for certain conditions, but at least a quarter of them said, at least in some cases I would be willing to participate, which means about 60% uh, of, of the physicians were saying I would never participate in any way. And this is something I found really kind of interesting. It was a study that was done uh, among hospitalized patients. All of these patients had very serious medical conditions. So it wasn't a hypothetical question to them. It was real to them. Um, and the question was, with these, this particular kind of a medical condition, which is worse, this condition or death? And uh, you'll see that uh, 
there was uh, so roughly about 60% that were either partially or, or completely supportive of the idea that bowel and, or sorry, bowel and bladder incontinence was worse than death. Relying on a breathing machine to live was worse than death for a majority of people. So we all have a different perspective on what it is that makes our life worthwhile. But what is clear, at least from this one survey, is that uh, for some people who have these medical conditions who are really limited by in their ability to experience life the way they used to, many of these people say, I'd rather be dead. And I think that's what uh, has led to medical assistance in dying. So both of us will be prepared to answer questions. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Um, I'm very glad that you're here today because I really always look forward to having input from people who have different backgrounds and, and disciplines from my own in this particular topic. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, I'm Rob Weiler. I am a uh, clinical anesthesiologist. But at the time that, that this, this topic began, I was in an administrative position as well. And so when this is before the actual legislation, so when uh, when the, it became a request that I was to provide a response to patients who had made this request, even when it was still called PAD or Physician Assisted Death, I was kind of responsible for getting something organized from the region. And then later on, when the legislation came out, it came into uh, trying to develop some, again, more organized response, first uh, in the Saskatoon area where I was working, and then later on in the, in the province. And really what I want to do with this is give you some perspectives uh, of what providers, and I, I say they're for physicians, but I mean providers because nurse practitioners as well. And just a little bit about how it's affected us because if I was to tell you three years ago, if you were to say to me how involved would I be in medical assistance and dying, I'd say I'm not even sure there's a real need for that. But being kind of thrown into uh, having to have more of a discussion and more understanding of, of the patients and where they're coming from, I've actually learned a lot. So I'm going to try to share some of that with you as well and uh, what that means. So when, when, it, and I, when I say this about, about physicians, please always say nurse practitioners in, in, uh, included in this, is that our medical training really does give us a predilection. As I as was pointed out before, I've done decades of intensive care where you do everything possible to sort of preserve life. And so our predilection is to really offer any kind of treatment and avoid death to, and prolong life. And we really, we, um, we actually have kind of this almost a, a perspective of denial and kind of almost we try to be more optimistic and, and trying to promote a longer life. And we don't really get much training in, in being comfortable with managing patient, patients at the end of life and with palliative kind of conditions. That's why you see, in fact, it's always a, a challenge to get good palliative care resources. And certainly we don't really get much in the way of education about assisting people in the terminal stage of their life. As was already pointed out, the, the law was was designed to give us an exemption to help patients choose an option to end their life. Um, I personally think the law was pretty well done. I mean, there's some questions about um, whether it's going to be challenged about some things, but when they actually made the law, whether it fits exactly with Carter isn't so important as I think the legislators really struggled with trying to balance out what they think is the protection of society and the vulnerable in society, along with giving the individual that autonomous choice over their own life about the quality of their life. And by doing that, you'll see what's written into it sometimes are things that are a bit of a, a challenge to interpret between the medical side and the legal side as to how do we interpret some of the language that's in the law. But I think the law actually was clever in that it, it gave some flexibility uh, for us to do this, both clinically uh, uh, to meet the, the needs. And of course, there is some uncertainty of interpretation, which from some of my colleagues, they really feel uncomfortable with. They kind of go where they like it a little bit more prescriptive, they like it a little bit more direct. Did you either qualify or you don't qualify? I personally am very happy with the, I'm not sure if I want to use the term vagueness, but with the sort of flexibility that I see written into the law. Foreseeable death has been brought in, into it. Um, I personally like, because it's not just written as foreseeable death, it says foreseeable death taking into account all of their circumstances and no prognosis being made, which means I can tailor make it to that patient's individual conditions. So it's not a, dependent upon what their diagnosis is. It depends upon what they look like clinically. It's what their, their life is like at this particular time. An intolerable suffering. I know uh, Brian and I have talked about this. So if something's intolerable, how can we ask them to wait 10 days of reflection? Or better yet, how can some patients with neurologic conditions wait a year before they actually ask 
for medical assistance denying, having qualified and having many of us saying they actually met the criteria. How could they then, if it's intolerable, wait that long? And for us, personally, I interpret the intolerable as a, a level of severity of their condition because many of us actually tolerate the intolerable all the time. And I'm not talking about your kids and things, but you know what I mean? Like we, we do tolerate the intolerable before, for many reasons. They may want to wait to see the, a wedding or, or the birth of something. So they will tolerate the intolerable and it's a level of, of severity of their condition. It's not that it's no longer tolerated for one more minute. The other thing that's, that is required is the recording and storage of charts. And now in particular, we've upgraded the sort of the, the federal reporting that's required. And what that means is it's really quite daunting. There's kind of some threatening language. Oh, you have to do this within a certain time period and not. And so when I saw this as a real threat to getting providers, so we were able to work with these, our in Saskatchewan Health Authority to have the, the health authority actually take responsibility for that. And they are our reporting mechanism as long as we work within the provincial program. And I'll, I'll be honest, before we had the legislation, I got a lot of CMPA involvement because, uh, you, know, it was, you know, are we at risk? You know, when we go to the courts, are we, are we putting ourselves at risk? And our, our legal support and advice is CMPA, which is there to protect us. It's not there to help the patients. And we certainly saw that clash very soon because the advice was to make sure we're safe, not the patients. So to be quite honest, since we've been doing more of this, we actually have involved, we don't involve CMPA in this. And of course, I also want to just mention some things that have affected me in terms of just learning about this. Some, as you know, some uh, physicians, and, and Brian gave you the statistics, you really um, are against the whole idea of a physician-assisted death, and they just say that, no, our job, we were trained to preserve life, we, we do this at all costs. And others, just like other members of society, they might have religious or philosophic or ethical reasons that they don't want to be involved with ending someone's life. And others, and I, I put myself in this category, the prime motivation is prevent suffering, and this way we see it is one of the choices of end of life. So in fact, our medical school, which where I trained in, is we do no harm, and ours is the idea of promoting uh, quality of life and, and to assist people to avoid suffering. And like I said, I did decades of intensive care, and I, I wrote orders that actually caused suffering. And patients who would have probably very little uh, opportunity for survival were given every often painful and distressing sort of treatment. So I, I think carefully about the fact of what we ask of our patients in our need to preserve their life as opposed to what they want. And, uh, and what, what the other thing that's kind of important is the majority of physicians, nurse practitioners actually support MAID as an end-of-life option, but not very many are willing to participate. But the same goes with palliative care. And the same goes with many other things that are time intensive and, and, and busy when they've always got other things to do. And it also requires a continuous ongoing need for education because we have new medical students, new residents. And so having done one bout of education does not help uh, on, 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 the, on the consistency for the future. And of course there are cost and time barriers. And it's, uh, it's very time intensive work. Uh, mercifully, I, I took on this work and I was a part-time administrator and started to consume all of my administrative time. But that allowed me that, that luxury of spending more time with the patients because it's through that time spending with the patients that I got to understand them better. Because when we're, we're educated in healthcare, we're taught to tell people what they need, to give them their options, to, to recommend things, to, to make decisions in a fairly paternalistic way. What I've had to learn with this is, is literally listen more because they tell, patients tell us what they want, what the quality of their life is. And we have to listen. It's not what I think the quality of their life is, what they can tolerate, it's what they say they see <coughs> and what they can tolerate. So what this means is that we have to sort of educate our, our practitioners, nurse practitioners and about what the end of life conditions are and to include their knowledge about palliative care. So they know that patients have to address that question that was earlier. It's not a choice of dying or living uncomfortably, but also know what their other palliative uh, options are. And right now we don't do a lot of, of education in that aspect. 
And certainly, uh, one of the things that was mentioned earlier is that patients have to have capacity, especially at the end. So we all have to be able to assess capacity. And the, the law assumes that most clinicians can assess capacity for this. This is a fairly black and white concept. Knowing the choice is death. It's not like some very kind of unsure or complex surgery, what the outcome is going to be, what the complications are. This is a fairly low level of, of yes or no, I understand what being dead is. So, but assessing capacity is important. If there's any doubt, of course, the law has written into it that you should get a more objective view of capacity. And you uh, at times find that you have to get some experts in terms of opinion uh, about, about this. Let's see if I can go back to the slideshow here. Uh, okay. Uh, some probably have managed to mess up the. And uh, one of the other things I wanted to mention is that even though we can be trained in this, and I'm an anesthetist, these are my drugs. This is what this is what I do. But you don't do them this way. Uh, I talked about that. Um, we don't use these medications in these doses. The, the doses are an anesthetic, but they are different than the usual anesthetic doses. The locations, we go into people's homes, we go into small apartments, poor dimly lit, dimly lit areas to meet the patient's needs and, and requests. And the social circumstances, we've got families. You might have 10, 15 family members wanting to be present. As your observers into this final act of this patient's life. And so that puts you in a different light than even the operating room where I work all the time under people scrutinizing. Never is it family. That, that it's there to, to see this. Technical challenges, patients who are sick, who've had chemotherapy, they don't necessarily have good venous access. This is, as I say, our only op option that we offer right now is intravenous access, I'll talk about that. So uh, it, it can be a real challenge. And so when I see patients, I'm always looking at them kind of going, is this gonna be a successful last act of their life or is it gonna be another traumatic experience for them? In this. And so there's high pressure social environments, remote locations. Those are things we're not used to. Oral prescriptions, we decided early on. So at least in Saskatoon, we said, I didn't know of a way that we could prescribe something that was both palatable, because palatability, believe it or not, is a major impediment to oral prescriptions. If something is so bitter and, and unpleasant that people can only take half of a lethal dose, that's not acceptable. Or if you give someone a prescription to go put in their medicine cabinet, we worry about diversion, about it being lost, about is it really the patient consenting when they actually get that. So we decided early on, we didn't know how we were gonna, we were gonna safely provide an oral prescription for patients. So in fact, we've actually worked with the college and we've come up with the idea that if you're gonna do it, if we do get eventually something like cecobarbital, which is a palatable oral option, and should patients want this, although most patients are quite happy having an anesthetic, I'll be honest, they, they think back to their own experience with anesthetics, they go, I want one of those. And, and if they do have to have an oral one, we've said that we will actually provide it and we will be there until it's successful. And should it not be successful, they've consented to actually have a completion done intravenously because we felt that way it was at least offering them a choice, but it was also providing safety to society and ourselves. Uh, what's unique? Isolation of the practice and roles. Sometimes there aren't very many of us. There's really only three of us in Saskatoon. We've hired a nurse practitioner here in Regina. There is different psychological stresses, as you can imagine, because you're dealing with family in a very highly emotional state. I did that in the intensive care, but it was a different approach, right? Now I'm, at, at that point, you're kind of advocating for a totally different approach to their management. In this case, it's, it's more of a sort of a supportive role for the families and the patients. As I mentioned, there is this significant administrative burden with the new reporting legislations, time commitment, and a small number of providers. What's the benefit to the patients? Well, they really appreciate that choice. When you take a look at some of the cancer patients that are done, you might shorten their life, because we don't really make a prognosis. We don't know how long patients with any diagnosis will live, but it might only be one or two weeks. But it's the one or two weeks they don't want to survive. It's the one or two weeks that's gonna be the most miserable for them, that they're anticipating and they want to just jump over and avoid. They know that they're dying. They don't want to die, but they don't want to go through that last terminal week or two that they, they've seen others go through, they don't want to go through that. They want choice. Believe me, autonomy is huge. And just that the idea that somebody's gonna have to look after my personal care, as, as you mentioned about what things are worse than dying, they would rather die than have somebody look after some of those very personal issues that will arise in their, in their worsening health. 
And of course, it really is very patient-centered. We always talk about patient-centered. Well, this is the ultimate patient-centered. The patient directs everything. They say, this is what my life is like. I get to determine what my quality of my life is like. This is what I would like you to do for me. And of course, the question is, is it more stressful for family? In fact, you know what it's like for many patients at the end of their life? Families come and go. They're living in BC. They're flying back to Phoenix. They don't know whether they can come. They want to be there for the death. And, and everybody's kind of in this limbo. And everybody kind of goes, wow, this way we can actually do this. All my family can be here. My children can be here. And everything is done in a much more organized fashion. And so there are some significant benefits to patients. Now, as I said, there aren't very many providers. And I think that we will get more. And it is a matter of, of doing more education and getting more understanding among providers. But for me, the biggest thing has been I've learned to listen to patients. I talk fast. I used to tell people a lot of times what they needed. Now I'm listening. They tell me clearly what they need. And, if it's, and, and it'll often open up a discussion. We've done more referrals to palliative care if it's missing. And I'll reassure you that no patient that we've seen has been denied palliative care. So it's not a matter of it's palliative care or medical system dying or suffering or medical system dying. All of the patients that we've dealt with have had access to the palliative care that they wanted. And of course, there's some positive feelings from being truly involved with uh, patient-centered care. I have, I'm an anesthetist, I don't see a lot of people saying thanks for the anesthetic, but I have had amazing feedback, positive feedback from families. Actually, I get patients at the very last moment of their life being very grateful for what, what's being done for them. And of course, it's also allowed those of us to be more comfortable about thinking about what really matters in, in life in terms for ourselves and having that discussion with the people that matter to us. And so that's a very valuable lesson to learn. You learn about, we work all of our lives for the possessions and the positions we hold, but it's just the people that counts. So you learn that from this. So I guess I really just wanted to give you that sort of perspective of what it's meant for me to see the, the requests of patients, why they have, have, I guess, directed our legislators to make this an option for them, how the legislation, I think, has tried to balance their rights with, with society, and how we have been included in, into this management of one of their end-of-life options. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I hate to cut this to a close. I think we could carry this discussion on for a long time. Please join me in thanking our panelists for their thoughtful comments and insights. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to all of you for your participation and your questions as well. I will turn the floor over to Neil Robertson to close our event for the evening. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Just, I have the uh, privilege of thanking our speakers, but before I do, just a, a couple of things. Uh, this is just one of uh, many events that Johnson Shama sponsors. There's information uh, on them at the back, uh, but in particular, uh, next week is the Tansley Lecture, uh, Changing Freshwater Availability as Viewed from Space. Please consider attending that. But as I say, look, look at the other information either at the back or on uh, Johnson Shama website. Um, would say people are welcome to stay when it's over. There's food and beverage uh, at the back if you want to stay and, and talk. Uh, but just then, finally, a few people to thank. Certainly Johnson Shoyama under the leadership of Doug Moan, but in particular uh, Bob Hawkins, who has been the chair of uh, not only this year but previous years, the Law Day Lecture, uh, and Karen Jaster for organizing the event. Uh, but really, first and foremost, our speakers, Amy Zarzechny, Brian Salty, and Dr. Wob Weiler, uh, I think she said it, it's been a great, uh, a great lecture. Uh, the time's flown and we could all listen more, but it has to come to an end. Uh, but we all leave here, I'm sure, better informed about this important subject. So please join me in thanking our speakers. Thank you.